Okay, thank you. Thank you, everyone, for coming to the last talk of this uh, lecture series. Was it is there a bit of an echo? Yeah, Andre is going to take care of it. Okay, good. Andre, okay. Andre is the echo guy. <laughs> I still see some people getting into the room, so maybe I'll wait another another minute. Okay, so last time we did we did we discussed the Coulomb the definition of the Coulomb branch due to Bobham and Finkelberg Nakajima. So let me just recall the notations. So we had G a, a reductive group and N a representation of G. And then we produce from this um, first a space called RGN. And then we studied the homology of the space, which was an algebra, AGN. So the G of O equivariant homology of the space RGN. Um, we also had a quantized version where we, which was defined by adding C star covariance to the homology. So that this H bar quantization parameter is the C star equivariant parameter. And then we defined the space, the Coulomb branch, MC GN, to be spec of this algebra. Um, we also considered a few variants of it. Um, maybe I will not need them today, but we had some variants of it where we were able to make, for example, a, a candidate for a resolution of the space using project of a graded ring. Okay, so today um, we're going to be interested in, in quiver, what's called quiver gauge theories. So what that means is we fix a gamma, a directed graph of the quiver. And at the moment, I make no assumptions on gamma. You can have multiple edges, can have loops, so on. We're just finite. <laughs> and then we have uh, two dimension vectors, V and W. So they live in the natural numbers, the I. I is the vertices of the graph. And the reason why we have two is because we have this uh, framed picture in mind. So we have a circle for every vertex of the graph. Here we have some edge of the graph. And then for each, we have a frame here and I put WI in the frame. And from this data of the graph, the dimension vectors, we construct a group G, which is simply the product of the GLs of the vertices and a representation N, which is simply the direct sum of first Homs inside the graph and then Homs to the framing. I don't know why there's so much direct sums. Can't at least get rid of one of them. So I remind you, we discussed this before, but there's two spaces we're going to consider. One is the Higgs branch. Um, oh, sorry, maybe one piece of the notation before I get there. Associated to gamma, we have um, G gamma, that cats moody the algebra, symmetric cats moody the algebra. So it, it doesn't care about the orientation of the edges of this graph. Um, mostly I'll be concerned with the case when there's no loops. When there are loops, maybe this exactly what Lee algebra we associate, maybe it becomes a little bit more complicated. I'm not too much expert. So mostly we'll consider the case without loops. But, um, associated, and then um, associated to this V and W, we build a dominant weight lambda. And mu, just a, a weight. And they are related to V and W by these familiar equations. Lambda is the sum of fundamental weights 
with coefficients given by the wise, and lambda minus mu is the sum of simple roots with coefficients given by vi's. Okay. So, uh, yeah. so as I said, we have two spaces now associated to this data. We have the Higgs branch, I'll write mh lambda mu, and this is just a Nakajima corval variety by definition. I take the cotangent bundle of n and I take the Hamiltonian reduction um, by at, at the moment map level zero and at the GIT parameter chi, and I use my, um, by, by the group G. And then I have a Higgs, sorry, then I have a Coulomb branch, just the Coulomb branch for this gauge theory defined above. I just write lambda mu for the, instead of G and N. Okay, so the first question, of course, is like, what can you say? What is this space? What is this? Um, Coulomb branch associated to the quiver gauge theory. So this is some, well, yeah, that's, that's going to be basically the topic of today's lecture. So um, let's start with the case when G gamma is a finite type. So finite type means it's a, the Dinkin, it's the Dinkin diagram of an ADE Lie algebra. In this case, um, I'm going to write G gamma for the corresponding uh, group, or maybe slightly more precisely the Langlands dual group. But again, this Langlands duality is going to be irrelevant because we're in this um, simply laced type. So G gamma is going to be the corresponding group. And then we're going to study the affine Grassmannian of G of gamma. Okay, so let, let me just be clear that there is a um, two affine Grassmannians in the story. One affine Grassmannian, which was used to define the Coulomb branch. And that's the affine Grassmannian of G, the gauge group. And now I'm talking about the affine Grassmannian of the group whose Dinkin diagram is given by gamma. When I first heard about the BFN construction, it was at a conference in Paris. It was in January of 2015. And, and Sasha was giving a talk. It was organized by Vassarot, I think. And, and at some point in the talk, I interrupted Sasha and I said, you mean to tell me there's two affine Grassmannians in this story and they're not related? And Sasha said, yes. Okay, so this affine Grassmannian is affine Grassmannian of this ADE group, G gamma. And I write uh, G gamma of, so it's G gamma of K, my G gamma of O. And I'll just recall the notation, we have GER lambda, so that's the, G gamma of O orbit through the point T lambda. So it's going to be turned out to be the same lambda that I'm using above. So this lambda um, was obtained using just this dimension vector and it encoded a dominant weight for, for G gamma. And, and then I also will have um, this slice W mu. I mentioned him before, but let me mention him again. So how is he defined? I take um, G gamma of T inverse, and then I take this, this first congruent subgroup condition and take its orbit through T mu. So it's the kernel of the evaluation map. So it gives me these transverse orbits, the gray lambdas. And then I define this F and Grassmannian slice W lambda mu to be gray lambda bar intersect W mu. So it's a, it's a, sub, it's a finite dimensional subscheme of of W lambda. So it's, it's an affine scheme, the finite type. So that's the definition of W lambda. So here's a, a, the, first, the first theorem about this, these Coulomb branches is that they are these affine Grassmannian slices. Um, so well, sorry, in, in this circumstance. So again, we have the assumption that G gamma is a finite type. And also the assumption is that mu is dominant. Okay, so recall the construction of this, um, of this thing didn't require mu to be dominant. We just took mu and used it to, the, I mean, mu is obtained using, related to this Vs, but it had nothing to do with being dominant or otherwise. So here, only if it's dominant, do we have this now. So if mu is dominant, then 
the Kulo branch is isomorphic to the affine Grassmannian slice. Okay, and, and um, if you've been following my talks, then you should find this theorem not surprising at all because I already said many times that the Coulomb branch is supposed to be symplectic dual to the Higgs branch. And I've also said a few times that the affine Grassmannian slice is symplectic dual to the Nakajima core variety. So um, this theorem just a confirmation of those two facts. So what happens when mu is not dominant, but still in the finite type situation? Then we can define something called a generalized affine Grassmannian slice. The definition looks a little bizarre. First of all, rather than working in the affine Grassmannian, I actually work inside the group G of K, and I form the following thing. So I consider all um, matrix, all elements of G of K, which emit a Gauss decomposition like this. So inside of any, so maybe I should fix some notation before I write this. So here, um, U and U minus in G gamma denote opposite unipotent subgroups. And so inside any um, inside group of matrices or any reductive group, you can consider those elements which emit a uh, Gauss decomposition, like uh, upper triangular, diagonal, lower triangular decomposition. So upper triangular, diagonal, lower triangular. So I'm looking at those matrices which admit, or those elements of G of K, which admit such a decomposition such that um, the lower triangular and upper triangular piece are one mod T inverse, and the diagonal piece is like T to the mu times this diagonal thing, which is one mod T inverse. So at first glance, it seems like a slightly strange thing to do. Here, here are some reasons why um, it's a good idea. Oh, the meaning of the subscript. So if, if G is any group, and then I have G if T inverse, and it admits a morphism to G, which takes T inverse to one, and the kernel of this map. Is G1 T inverse, sometimes called the first congruent subgroup. So you can, the matrices, so for example, this U1 T inverse would look something like this one, 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 one down the diagonal here, and here up, up in the upper part would be like T inverse plus T to the minus two. So, okay. Um, so where was I? Yes, so that's the definition of um, this W mu, and it looks a little bizarre, but here's a few reasons why it's not so strange. So, so first of all, if mu is dominant, it's not very obvious, but it's not hard to see that, that it map, well, of course, this W maps to the affine Grassmannian just because G of K maps to the affine Grassmannian. So you map, if, you, if mu is dominant and you map W mu into the affine Grassmannian, then um, I realize my G sub gamma looks a little like my G R. That's a bit of a problem, but anyway. Hopefully no one gets confused besides me. Okay, if mu is dominant, then W mu maps into that, uh, maps isomorphically onto mu W, the thing I previously called W mu in the affine Grassmannian. So there's not two different things called W mu. So that's good. Two. Um, um, this space W has a modular interpretation. I won't recall it. Um, it's not really. Um, it, it's in terms of well, let me vaguely recall it. It's in terms of principal G bundles on P one with a reduction to a Borel and to an opposite Borel. Um, I don't find it any more enlightening than this matrix definition. In fact, I, I find the matrix definition more enlightening. But anyway, this is how it's originally defined by Raman Frankelberg Nakajima. And three, which is closely related to two and sort of also closely related to this matrix definition. Um, and this is, I think, the first incarnation of this WMU. It's some kind of moduli space of singular monopoles. 
and, and I say this in a, this is appearing in the physics literature. So I don't, I'm not sure if there's yet a precise mathematical statement here, but this is in the physics literature. Furthermore, the Mufti and Gavit. Okay, so that's some reasons why why this W is not as like random as it appears. Anyway, once you have this W mu, then we define the generalized affine Gerstmannian slice W lambda mu to simply be this W mu. Well, normally we would take W mu intersect girl lambda bar, but now we're not in affine Gerstmannian, we're inside this G of K. So we take W mu intersect the double coset space. And put the closure. If I don't, if I write W lambda mu without a bar on top, it just means the same thing but without the closure there. So this thing is called a generalized. So one. Um, one funny feature about this space is it's often not, it's, I started the talk, the, my series of talks by talking about conical symplectic singularities. Well, I haven't even talked about, or conical symplectic resolutions. I haven't even talked about a resolution of space, but actually this space is not actually usually conical. So it's not conical, or at least doesn't actually admit an obvious C star action making it conical. Mm -hmm. I don't know exactly if it's possible to prove that it's literally not conical, but at least doesn't admit an obvious C star action making it conical, not conical, unless you might think it's unless mu is dominant, but it's actually unless mu is almost dominant, unless mu plus rho, the usual rho is dominant. Okay. Um, I mentioned last time the physicists and, and Nakajima sort of introduced this notation in the mathematical literature have a division of these theories um, into good, bad, and ugly. So good, in this case, good means mu is dominant. Bad is mu plus rho is not dominant. And ugly is the intermediate case when mu plus rho is dominant, but mu is not dominant. Okay, let's see some examples. Oh, I mean, maybe I should say the, but okay, this theorem, with this definition of W lambda mu, I won't bother writing it again. With this definition of W lambda mu, this generalized slice, I, I mean, obviously I wouldn't be telling you this, but this, if it wasn't true, but this theorem extends. So now we can erase. Noel, I'm very sorry, but uh, we, I missed a question in the chat. That was a question of six minutes ago. But I already answered it. Already, okay. Yeah. <laughs> I saw it and I, I answered it. Um, <laughs> oh, okay, I'm sorry. Right, right here. <laughs> okay, it's right there also for me. Okay. No problem. Um, so this theorem of, of BFN extends to the case when mu is not dominant when we use this definition of the generalized affine Gerstmannian slice. Again, in the finite type case. If it's not finite type, it's not totally clear, I guess, what the meaning of anything I wrote here is. Okay. Um, so let's see some examples. So the first example, was with the with this G gamma being SL2. And so my quiver just has one vertex, and I'm gonna take let's consider the general case. I have a framing N and the M here. I discussed this last time a, a few times when I was talking about um, example when I was talking about the BFN construction. So in this case, lambda is n times the first fundamental weight, mu is n times the first, I mean the only fundamental weight minus m times the only simple root alpha. Like if, if you like, you can just think of this as n and this is n minus two n is perfectly good way to think of it. Um, the corresponding Nakajima quiver variety we discussed before is just the cotangent bundle of the Grossmannian. So the mh and the mu is cotangent bundle of the Grossmannian m n. And what's our Coulomb branch or our generalized affine Grassmannian slice? Well, it's actually not very hard to read off. Like this thing looks like a big mess. This 
<laughs> Gauss decomposition business, but it's actually not very hard to, to analyze it, especially in this SL2 case. And when you do it, if after maybe possibly taking transpose of your matrix or something, you reach the following nice description. So it's the set of all matrices, A, B, C, D. And these are all matrices over polynomial ring in T. So I got rid of all powers of T inverse just by scaling through. And A is monic of degree uh, M, exactly degree M. Uh, B and C are of degree uh, less than M. D, I impose no condition at all. And AD, well, except for that AD minus BC must be equal to T to the end. So it's a, it's a nice space. Um, you can have fun playing around with what it looks like for different values of M and N. For example, you might try to figure out what, how the degree of D is sort of affected by the degrees of the other things. In this space, um, uh, at least when, um, when this, uh, in the dominant case, in the M minus two M is greater than zero, then this space is isomorphic to a M N minus M um, slow to assess. Okay, so that's one nice, um, one nice example. And this, um, generalizes in a few ways. Well, one, one way we could say that this generalizes is that um, there's a similar kind of matrix description of it for any GLN, but also for any GLN or any finite or aff any even affine type A, so these G gamma is finite or affine type A, this, this space or, or more precisely, I mean, in the, aff in the affine, in the affine type, I don't usually write W lambda mu, I just write MC lambda mu. This space is a bow variety. Joel, I think we have a, you might have a question in the Q&A, please. Great. Um, uh, oh, okay, this is my statement. Okay, let me, I'll come to that in one second. So it, let me just finish this, right? If G gamma is, is finite or affine type A, then this is a bow variety. This was proven by, Nakajima and Takayama. And we'll hear more about bow varieties in, in Richard Romani's talks, talk next week. So it's some explicit description of it, which is um, sort of different than this matrix description. Okay, there was a question about does symplectic duality statement still hold if it's not conical? Um, well, it depends exactly which part of the symplectic duality statement. Um, but, but the short answer is yes. Like the, um, if we focus on like the third part, the part about the category O, or even the second part about the part about the homology, uh, those parts still, those parts do hold, as I'll say in a few minutes, um, even, even when mu is not dominant. Okay, um, so that's, my, I guess, it's a sort of second example or a meta example. A third example um, is, um, interestingly enough, how to get the, the Grassmannian, a, a, a finite cotangent bundle of Grassmannian as a, as a Coulomb branch. And, and it's like this, if you take lambda to be, if you take G gamma to be SLN and you take lambda to be omega M plus omega N minus M, and you take mu to be zero. If you convert that to quiver data, what it means is you have a one here, two framings and an increasing sequence like so, and then a constant sequence like so. So that's the quiver data coming from this lambda nu and this affine Grassmannian slice. In fact, this case, it's not even a generalized affine Grassmannian slice because mu is zero, it's dominant. This affine Grassmannian slice is just a cotangent one. Grassmannian M. And you can see this just from the geometry of the affine Grassmannian. Um, oh, and another example, I was inspired to add this example because of um, 
uh, Eugene's talks, uh, he's like, uh, said I've been neglecting the Hilbert scheme. Indeed, I have been neglecting the Hilbert scheme. <laughs> so here he is in this, for this quiver data. Um, so, or for this uh, generalized uh, or generalized Affinger's money and slice, if you like, of, of type A11. Or, uh, yeah. Um, Anyway, anyway, for this for this quiver data, the, the corresponding Coulomb branch is the um, is the Hilbert scheme. As is the, I mean, technically the Coulomb branch is singular, so it's really not really the Hilbert scheme. It's really just C two mod. I mean, C just sim symmetric and just sim n C two. Is there another question? Oh, no, 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 it's the same question. Okay, so yeah, that's that's it for this examples. Oh, maybe one more, one more example. Another another classic example. We take this quiver data, which is the same as produces the cotangent bundle of the flag variety as the as the as the Higgs branch. It also produces the cotangent bundle of the flag variety as a Coulomb branch. This is the same as W n omega n minus one zero. You know, usually I would have put the anyway. Okay, great. So, what are some properties? What are some results we know about these these generalized Affinger's minion slices, and more generally these these Coulomb branches associated to quiver data? Yeah. Oh. Okay. Right. Sorry, Joe. Is it true that uh, cotangent bundle to flag varieties are self-dual for any group? And yeah. Simplicity. Yes. Yeah. But only only in type A are they realized as as Higgs and Coulomb branches of of um, gauge theories. Okay. Yeah. Oh, sorry. In, in outside in the general type, maybe. It's better to say that the cotangent bundle of G mod B is the is the Langan's dual group. Yeah. Okay. So here's some general properties. So so for the first one, we go back to the case of, of the finite type. And I mentioned, of course, that, that there's this more there's this map from W mu to the Affinger Smanian, and if we restrict it to to W lambda mu, we'll land inside Gur lambda bar. Well, this map is, of course, far from injective. Maybe, maybe I should have mentioned this from the very beginning, but one fact is that the dimension of this W lambda mu is twice rho lambda minus mu, um, whereas the dimension of for lambda bar is just twice rho of lambda. So if mu is not dominant, like this negative mu will actually be contributing to the dimension, so the dimension will become bigger than for lambda bar. Right? Like if you imagine the extreme case when mu is anti-dominant, then this, this is going to be making a positive number. So, okay, so um, so this map is not injective, but if we restrict to the attracting locus, um, and I should say this attracting locus only exists if mu is actually a this, this W lambda mu exists even if mu is not a weight of the lambda representation, but the attracting locus only exists if mu is a weight of lambda representation. You can prove in this finite type case pretty easily that, it, um, that the, this torus has a fixed point if and only if mu is a weight. So if we was, the, in that, and when, it, when it has a fixed point and then we take this attracting locus, then the map is injective. This gives an isomorphism. Between the attracting locus and Kalanda bar intersect S mu, which I never defined before, but this S mu um, probably, I mean, maybe S mu minus to be technically correct. I think um, people have maybe seen it before. It's the U sorry, minus K orbit. Let's see. And um, this, 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 so this result, the fact that this thing gives, this, this restriction gives a nice morphism is the theorem of pre -life. 
And as I mentioned before, this is true for all, even if mu is not a weight, both sides will be empty if mu is not a weight of the lambda organization. Um, so in particular, if we take the top homology of this attracting locus, I mentioned like a long time ago that I really like this top homology of the attracting locus because that's what enters this decomposition of the homology. Um, if we take this top homology of the attracting locus, it will be the same as the top homology here, which will be isomorphic to V of lambda mu, and this is by Mirkovich Bologna. So one way to think about this generalized affine Grossmannian slice is it's something which contains this mirkovich volonian locus as the attracting locus. It's just something cooked up to be of twice the dimension of this, this Gerlander bar intersecting smear. Um, and this leads to the following conjecture, which I think is very important to open conjecture of, of, well, formulated by VFN. They call it the geometric Satake conjecture. So it's the statement that for any gamma, not necessarily a finite type. So in the finite type case, it's true, not a finite type. Um, there is some kind of vector space isomorphism between the homology of the attracting set in the, this Coulomb branch associated to lambda mu and the V lambda. And then I should, of course, point out that this, we already know um, by Nakajima's work, is the homology of this central fiber, let me show you, F lambda mu, the central fiber in the Nakajima pro variety. So that we'd get this isomorphism from left to right is what's um, predicted by symplectic duality. This is like my second uh, homological, some homological symplectic duality prediction. But this is not known. Um, the only case, as far as I know, outside of finite type is where it's, it's known in affine type A. And to show you that it's how unknown it is, um, we don't even, we would expect that this torus, um, so uh, there's always a torus C star to the I, which I was calling T. I hope it wasn't too confusing because it's the torus of this G gamma, not the torus of the gauge group G. So this torus, um, so one like part of this conjecture would be that this torus um, has a fixed point in this Coulomb branch, if and only if the uh, mu is actually a weight. Um, and that's, that's even that, even that's not known. And I should say that this, this conjecture, I would say, is just a, a conjecture about an isomorphism of vector spaces. Um, we wouldn't expect sort of a geometrically defined action of our Lie algebra on the direct sum of these homologies, because that's sort of not what we see in geometric satake. Eh? But there is a sort of partial, I don't know, result or understanding of what should be going on. Um, so, in the usual geometric attacker, you can say something about restricting to a Levy subalgebra. And even in, in this story, you can also say something about what you expect about restricting to a Levy. So you would expect this isomorphism to be compatible with Levy restriction. And that's the statement you would like. So, sir, uh, Joel, this is defined in terms of slices in some uh, affine Grassmannian of some cut smoothie group. No, no, this, this is defined in as, Coulomb, as a Coulomb branch. So not, not as a generalized thing. So, so yeah, maybe I was a little, okay, let me just back up to the beginning then. So I said two things at the beginning. One, one right here. So we define this um, MC lambda mu as a Coulomb branch. So spec of this uh, homology, like, this official Coulomb branch definition over here. So spec of the homology of this um, VFN space. That's the definition of MC lambda mu. Right. And you when, realize it in terms of when gamma is a finite type, when gamma is a finite type, then 
um, and mu is not necessarily dominant, then this Coulomb branch is a generalized affine Grassmannian slice. Um, I don't think anyone knows or has tried to work it out whether this theorem really holds um, outside of the finite type, whether, whether we can consider these general, study these generalized affine Grassmannian slices for Katsumoto groups. Um, at least I don't think there's any published results in that direction. So for now, this, this thingy is just defined as a Coulomb branch. Okay, any other question? Okay, so this is all, I don't know, property one. So property one was this in the finite type that there's an isomorphism and it led to this conjecture. Okay, property two. Um, so property two, um, well, it's just the special case of this, but it's sort of a very interesting special case. So I'm going to highlight it. So what happens when we take lambda to be zero? Let's get, let's go back to the finite type situation. So whenever another way of knowing that I'm working in finite type is usually in the finite type I'll write W lambda mu, whereas in the general type I'll write this M C lambda mu. Okay. So in the finite type situation, in the finite type with lambda zero. I mean, there's no representation to think about. There's no gr lambda bar really to think about, just a point. But this W zero mu is actually still very interesting. It's actually nothing but the space of based maps uh, from P1. So I mentioned here, because this is uh, uh, to, to, G mod, to, G, to G mod B, G gamma mod B. So I mentioned here, since we're in a, it's supposed to be about numerative geometry, and this is obviously an object of study in numerative geometry. So base maps of degree of minus mu from P1 to G gamma mod B. Um, and this, this space has no, no attracting set. I mean, no, no fixed point level, no, no attracting set. But one feature it does have is it has, well, as every Coulomb branch has, which I didn't emphasize too, too much, it has this map, this integrable system map to um, T mod W. So careful, this T may be better to write this way. Let's see, see uh, mu T. Okay, so this is the, this, every Coulomb branch has a map to the spec of the um, geocovariant cohomology of a point. And, and which I identify in this case with this C to the mu, C to the minus. Um, so every Coulomb branch has that map. It's always an integrable system. And in this case, this map is well studied for these, um, oh, sometimes these spaces are called open zastat spaces, space of base maps. And one, one interesting feature is that if we take, we're maybe not interested in the, uh, we can't look at the homology of the tracking set because there is no tracking set, but we can look at the homology of this fiber of this integrable system map. And this is actually something you can do with any Coulomb branch, with w, any W lambda mu or any Coulomb branch, study this zero locus of the integrable system, which will contain the attracting set always when it exists. So this is something of general interest, but in particular, this case is quite interesting. And it turns out this is actually isomorphic to the weight space of a Verma module. So here, this M is a Verma module. And MU denotes the weight space of the Verma module, not, not the... <laughs> not the not the mu mirror module high slate mu as the notation looks like a little bit. So M is the Verma module of high slate zero. So interesting enough, we got these weight space of Verma modules coming up this way. And actually there's a generalization of this um, that the homology of the zero locus in W lambda mu will be a weight space of a Verma tensor of E lambda. So another uh, property or sort of generalization of this story is, of course, we started the story by with, we, we might be interested in G gamma, not of simply laced type, maybe finite type, but not simply laced. Um, so type B, B, C, and so on. And um, for that, there's a modification uh, for this. There's a modification of the Coulomb branch story.
Um, so that's due to uh, Nakajima and Weeks. And this is called um, Coulomb branches with symmetrizers. Um, and with this modified version of Coulomb branches, you can recover uh, these W length of music, for, for these generalized affine Grassmannian slices for any finite type G gamma. Um, and then another, another result I'd like to mention is, is okay, so back, so still of this uh, the G gamma of finite type simply laced. So ADE situation. Um, but now, but new, not necessarily dominant, then the symplectic leaves So in general, it's a very interesting question to study symplectic leaves of Coulomb branches for any G and N, and um, there's not any general results in that direction. But in this case, um, there is a result. So the symplectic leaves of this W lambda mu bar are what you might expect, they're W nu mu for nu between lambda and mu and nu dominant. Okay, and that's a theorem of Muthaya and Weeks. Okay, any questions about uh, these results and these uh, cool branches and these generalized slices? So what is the Higgs branch? that is taken in the case of non-simplicity? Ah, that's a very good question. I mean, there's no, um, there's no exact definition of a Nakajima quiver right in the non simplicity case. I mean, it's probably no, there was a recent work of Geisler, Clerk, and Shore on this topic. And um, there's a relationship between the definition they use for the Coulomb branch and this Geisler, Clerk, and Shore work. But, there's not exactly a Higgs branch, I think, and there's not exactly a statement of symplectic duality. So when you say that the homology of this middle fiber is a Verma module weight space, yeah. Uh, how much of the do you see like the action on the Verma module, or is it just the dimensions, or what is how much of the Verma module do you see? Um, just just the dimensions. Um, Although from the quantization, which I'll talk about soon. Um, so, so this, um, maybe this is a good, good time to segue into the next topic so let, and slightly answer your question. So let, let, me, let me get back to, um, so suppose I have um, symplectic resolution, although for my story now, it, the, the resolution part is gonna be sort of irrelevant. So let's just, Stick with just the, the x, the, the conical symplectic singularity. I'm going to forget about the resolution for a second. And um, as I mentioned before, we have this maybe attracting, say, but say it has a with a torus action. And actually, I suppose I'm going to have to erase the word conical. <laughs> That example certainly wasn't conical. Okay, so electric singularity with a torus action, and I have this attracting locus X plus. And then maybe I also have um, uh, some integrable system map. So I don't know if this is exactly a general feature of some electric singularities, but these um, Coulomb branches come with come with this integrable system, as I mentioned. So we had this integrable system map for any Coulomb branch to spec of Jacobian cohomology. Right, is there another question? Uh, is there a relation between symplectic duality and T duality? And are some familiar examples of integrable systems the list, like Hitchin system, et cetera? Um, so first of all, the, the um, um, I don't think there's a relationship between the T duality for these integral systems and symplectic duality. Um, 
Right, but I mean, there is some things you can say about like some kind of t duality for these interval systems, but let me not try to say anything because I'll probably say something that's not true. Um, are there familiar examples of integrable systems? I think so. Um, um, Hitchin system. I don't know of any exact way of the Hitchin system appearing this way. Um, but for, for, for example, one example of this picture, maybe it's a good example, so I'll put it right here, um, is if we take the nilpotent cone of SLN and it has an integral system called some, I guess usually called the gelfand setlin integral system. And it, it goes to um, uh, C to the N choose two. And how is it defined? You take your matrix A to the characteristic polynomial of the upper I by I minor of A. A. A I. <laughs> okay. So for all I, I equals one up to N minus one. And here A I is the upper I by I minor of A. And notice if you take the zero level of this, um, it will contain the upper triangular matrices, which is the attracting set for the Hamiltonian torus action. Um, okay, just going back to my general picture then, um, I had, would have, uh, this example is a very good example to keep in mind. So I have an X and, and it has this integrable system. Oh, well, if it's a cooler branch, it would go to this, this spec of the, this guy. So in general, it goes, I don't know, C to some uh, M. And um, then, this attracting set will be contained inside of the zero level of the integrable system. And if we now quantize X, so here A, not to be confused, this A, A here is going to be a quantization of X. And I mentioned last beginning, basically, that we consider a category O for A. And that will be thought of as a categorification of the topomology of this attracting set. Well, to be a bit more precise, I said before that I should consider this category O as a categorification of the topomology in the attracting set in the resolution. So it's really sort of the um, top quotient of this category, which categorizes this, thing. but roughly speaking, it categorifies this. And anyway, there is a map from the growth in the group to there. And on the other hand, we can consider, um, because of this integrable system, we get, it quantizes to a gelfand setlin subalgebra, uh, to, a, to, a, to a maximal commutative subalgebra of A, um, which maybe, I don't know if I'm gonna choose some special notation for it, maybe I'll just write as a polynomial. Right? So this is a maximal commutative subalgebra. And then we can consider the, um, we call this the gelfand setlin subalgebra, and then we study gelfand setlin modules for A. So modules for A, which are uh, locally finite for the action of this maximal commutative subalgebra. And we think of this as categorifies this zero level. So now, um, so for, for example, in this case of nilpotent cone, um, this was just, then this would just be the gelfand setlin modules or uh, just universal developing algebra vessel and module central character. Um, so to answer Michael's question, now finally, uh, Michael asked categorifies. Michael asked, um, in, in this uh, situation I wrote above with the base maps, um, can we say something about the, the zero level, of, can we say something about the action of, on the, when I think of it as a Verma module? 
And the answer is, well, not, not directly on the homology, but once I categorify it, yes. <laughs> so when I categorify it and figure these modules for this, galvin settler modules for the quantization, then, then the answer is yes. Okay, so this takes me into the last topic, which I have a few minutes to explain, 10 minutes. So, um, so well, the last topic is about quantizations of these uh, Coulomb branches for quiver gauge theories, these, which is generalized affine Grassmannian slices. Um, so, um, well, the, I'm going to explain basically two results in five, 10 minutes, so I guess five minutes each. So the first result was that, um, and now we're going to go for the finite type case for the first result. So then there's this algebra called uh, y mu, which is a, called a shifted union. So it's an algebra with this explicit generators and relations. It's, a, it's a related to the union. I mean, when mu is dominant, it's a subalgebra of the union. And when mu is not dominant, it's not a subalgebra, but it's closer to the union. And um, it, it acts um, by difference operators. on a big polynomial ring. Okay, so this, this act, this thing only depended on, on mu, but this polynomial ring depends on lambda. So the R ranges here from one up to VI, where VIs are calculated using lambda in the usual way, or lambda and mu in the usual way. So it's a finitely many variables. Whereas this Y mu has like infinitely many generators, and it acts by difference operators in this polynomial ring and finally many variables. And the image um, of, of, of it inside this ring of difference operators um, is called y lambda. And we call it truncated shifted yang. So here's a theorem which was proved in an, an appendix and by the following authors, I'll just put their initials because there's too many of them. But I guess they've all appeared already in this lectures, except for one of the K's, not me, it's Codera. I mean, one of the K's is me, but the other one is Codera. So I write his name out of school. Otherwise you can guess who everyone is. And the, the theorem is that this quantized BFN algebra associated to the same, where G and N are associated to the same quiver data, from lambda and mu is isomorphic to y lambda. And I just want to very briefly explain the idea of the proof. So that we can embed using localization, we can embed in localization in homology, equivariant homology. we can embed this Coulomb branch algebra inside the Coulomb branch algebra for the torus. And at the same time, we'll, we can also sort of forget about the representation just because it's sort of convenient to do so, but it's not that important. And, um, but at the cost of inverting some stuff. And, and um, I guess I should mention that it doesn't really act on this polynomial ring, but really on this polynomial ring, really more precisely on the ring of rational functions. So anyway, you have to invert some stuff. I won't bother writing, we have to invert. And uh, this guy, so this is just the Coulomb branch algebra corresponding to a torus. And the Coulomb branch of a torus with, with trivial matter, as they call it, no representation, is just um, the cotangent bundle of, a, of, of its Lie algebra. So in, so this can, can be quantized to a ring of difference operators. Using that description. So um, yeah, we, you can go into a lot of detail here. There's like a lot of crazy formulas you can write down, but well, let me not do that now. Um, but the, I just want to explain that the basic link between this shifted union and um, 
um, quantized Coulomb branch is that both of them act on a ring of difference operators. So this is a very um, important idea, I think. It leads to this isomorphism. And maybe just as a quick example of this, if we take this quiver associated with the cotangent bundle of the five variety, remember both as Coulomb branch and as Higgs branch, then the corresponding truncated shift to Yang is pretty easy to see. It's a universal enveloping algebra SLN modulo of the central character. There's also a whole story with some parameters and so on and so on. So you can get any central character this way, you vary the parameters. So that's what you get as the quantized Coulomb branch algebra for this theory. And then the last result that I want to mention. So, um, so this is my work. And again, uh, one new initial, this is Peter Tingley, who mentions the story. Um, so we, we studied these, um, we studied these, these truncated shifted Yangians, or more generally these quantized Coulomb branch algebras for any, for any G gamma. So we proved the following. First thing that there is a categorical Um, G gamma action on the direct sum of these category O's. And um, this categorifies, well, it categorifies, our, um, the representation it categorifies depends on these parameters that I suppressed, but it usually categorifies the tensor product representation. Like for the generic parameters of categories. And so product, you can also categorify other representations. Um, and so this works for any G, gamma. And the second result we proved is that this category O is a uh, symplectic dual um, to the category O for the quantized group variety. And while well, the key to proving both results, um, so to prove both results, we um, we related this category O to modules for uh, Kovanov, Lauda, Ruke, Webster algebra. So to some category of modules over this diagram, some diagrammatic algebra. And this diagrammatic algebra was already linked to categorification and linked to these quantized group varieties. And um, okay, I guess I stopped there. Sorry for rushing through the last results. Any question or comment? I had a question about uh, this shifted youngness. So you say that the G gamma was a finite type. So is there a, make sense to ask similar question when uh, it's a fine type, uh, type a fine type A, something like this? Um, yes. Um, there, there, there's, um, yes, um, I'm trying to remember what, what I know or don't know. I think that the, the, um, I mentioned that the way that this isomorphism works is that both algebras act, both this um, Coulomb branch algebra and, and the shifted Yangian algebra, they act on by difference operators here. And they have the same, and that's how we identify them. And I think if I remember correctly, that in general, it's this truncated, this shifted Yangian will have a sort of smaller image than this BFN algebra. At least um, 
this is some thing we discussed uh, a little bit with Olivia at some point um, that maybe one of these bigger, we should use some bigger yang yin. And, and Alex Weeks thought about this a bit, but I think there was no like definite conclusion here. So it, I think there may be some generalization of this as well, but I haven't thought about it recently and I don't know if anyone has. So um, I think it's not completely clear which kind of yang yin you should use to generalize this result outside of finite time. Okay, thanks. Any other question? Yeah, on the, in the Q and A, you have a uh, you have two questions in the Q and A. Okay. Um, are these shifted unions related to the usual union in some cases? Like those can be defined by RGT relations. I mean, yes. I mean, in this finite type case, um, maybe I should have said this before that y zero is just a usual union. So um, it's in the finite type case, we just have uh, the usual yang yin. And if mu is dominant, then y mu is a subalgebra of y zero, of y, which is just the usual yang. But if mu is not dominant, then it's um, um, something, it's not a subalgebra. Um, so continuing to, sorry, I said another, and, and Eugene asks, is it related to molecule Kunkov yang yin? I mean, in the finite type case, again, the, yeah. this, the, this, there's only one, I think there's only one kind of yang yins. And so it's the, the, we can use what, I mean, these y zero is just the usual yang yin to find however you like. Um, if, if mu is not dominant, I mean, in the finite type case, when mu is not dominant, these shifted yang yins are not usual yang yin, they're not some other buddies yang yin, but they're nothing that complicated. They have a pretty explicit description by generous relations is generalizing the you know, Dr Drenfeld new presentation of the union. And outside of finite type, again, I don't know. Um, you know, I, I, Alex thought about it and we talked about it with Olivia and maybe other people. But, um, I don't know how to generalize this, whether these molecules could be useful in general outside of finite type. There is another question by yeah, Jan. So can, if you change the cohomology theory to elliptic cohomology, <laughs> what is the quantization? Uh, I certainly never thought about that. I can answer the question if you change the cohomology theory to K-theory. <laughs> so if you change it, um, everything here, there's a, there's a, almost everything goes through if you change things to K-theory. There's a K-theoretic Coulomb branches, which end up being, certain, um, well, so, so this this version of what happens when you go to K theory was studied a lot by um, Finkelberg and Finkelberg uh, Simbaluk. In fact, I remember the last time I was at IHS, I was in the hallway just outside the room where you guys are and talking to Sasha about this. Um, so Sasha Simbaluk, that is. So if you work, um, if you do everything in K theory, um, maybe I'll just back up to this step. Let's go to this step. So this part can be done. Um, you can change things to K-theory. And uh, uh, Coulomb branch makes sense. Coulomb branch algebra makes sense. And the corresponding Coulomb branch can be identified in the, in the finite type case, can be identified in finite type and dominant case, can be identified with a slice in the affine flag variety. And the corresponding Coulomb branch algebra can be identified with instead of a truncated shifted Yangian with a truncated shifted um, quantum affine algebra. So instead of truncated shifted Yangians here, so this step here, where were we? Um, so this, everything I wrote here goes through in the K-theoretic setting where the shifted Yangians are replaced by um, shifted quantum affine algebras. And again, this is like some lot long papers of uh, Finkelberger and Simbaluk. Um, what happens in elliptic case? I have no idea. Uh, Joel, in the in this K theoretic case, is it known whether there is a hyperkähler structure on the slices? Uh, I think in some special cases, yes, but in, in general, I don't think no. I mean, There's even no. in the in the non K theoretic cases. Also, 
I mean, in, in general, it's conjecture that this Coulomb branches would have, in general, would have a hypercalar structure. Margin. So in, the, in the chronological case, there are also moduli of manifolds. So maybe. Oh, OK. Sorry, sorry. You're right. Yeah. OK, sorry. So you mean in the, yeah, OK. So if mu is dominant, then I think it's known that they have a hypercalar structure. And I think also in the K-theoretic case, I think, I think that there's a, um, okay, I'm not completely sure. I think it's known that, yeah, in, if mu is dominant and then the area is a finite type, then I think. Any further question? Let's see. Uh, no. Okay, let's thank uh, Joel again. <laughs>